Acts chapter 6, from verse 1 to the end. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brothers, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Shall we ask God's help once more? Most mighty God and gracious Father, we come to you, in the precious name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus whom Stephen preached, the Jesus whom we trust, despised and rejected by men generally, but adored, worshipped and believed by those whose eyes you've opened. Lord God, open our eyes this morning. Open them if they have been shut. Open them wider. Give us clearer sight of the beauties of Christ and his faithfulness to his servants and through his word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Even if you're a regular attender in this congregation, uh, it may be that you have slightly lost sight of this man, Stephen. We've been working our way through the Acts of the Apostles, and uh, just before the summer holidays, when we took a bit of a breather, we had got into Acts and chapter 6, where this man, Stephen, was introduced to us. If you weren't hearing those sermons, I hope you at least know who Stephen is. But if that's not the case, perhaps because you uh, don't uh, have much opportunity to hear the Bible being read and preached, let me remind you that Stephen was an unusual man. He was distinguished even amongst distinctive men. When the church in Jerusalem wanted to take care of some particular issues that were arising in that congregation, although there were thousands of them, yet there were seven who were chosen to take particular care of the Hellenists, that is the Greek-speaking widows, who it was suggested were being overlooked in the care that the church took of its most vulnerable. Stephen is identified first, and even though all of those men needed to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, 
Stephen is additionally identified in verse 5 of chapter 6 as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And it's Stephen who, for a couple of chapters now, becomes the focal point of Luke's narrative as he goes on impressing upon uh, the, uh, the man to whom he's writing these things the importance of what God is now doing through Christ and by the Holy Spirit. You remember that the, the uh, first, the, the gospel that Luke wrote, his first book, if you like, that's written to a man called Theophilus, and so is the book of the Acts. And the intention is that this man, and by extension the rest of us, may become well grounded in what we believe. We may know the way that God is working in the world. And that sometimes will shock us. Even in these chapters, we see Stephen, this godly man, becoming the violent catalyst for gospel progress. Now, as we get to chapter 6 and into chapter 7 and 8, we're entering what you might call phase 2 of the gospel project. If you go back to Acts and chapter 1, you would recall that the Lord Jesus intended that when the Holy Spirit had given power to his servants, they would be witnesses to him in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Up to this point, it's primarily been about Jerusalem. Although there's just that hint in chapter 5 that people from the places around Jerusalem were beginning to come and listen. But Jerusalem is and was always only intended to be the starting point. And now you'll be going to see that good news of Jesus Christ going out through Judea and Samaria. And with that gospel progress, there is an escalation of persecution. So then, Stephen, verse 8, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. The first thing to notice in the second half of chapter 6 is this faith and power. Now, we shouldn't be surprised to see a man who is described as full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, full of faith and the Holy Spirit, now being again identified as full of faith or, or grace and power. He is a man who is the walking example of what was promised in Acts 5 verse 32. We are his witnesses to these things and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. This church has been praying to God has been trusting in Christ, has been depending upon the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit of promise, having been given to them, is active in this congregation. And Stephen is a beautiful example of the Spirit's operations. He is a truly gracious man, and he is marked by spiritual sweetness and spiritual strength. And those two things not only could, but should go together in the experience of God's people. A spiritual sweetness, faith, grace, and spiritual strength, the power of the Holy Spirit. And as such a man, full of faith and power, Stephen acts in a way that up to this point, only the apostles have acted. If you go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, you'll see there that there was a promise made that by miracles and wonders and signs, first of all, Jesus of Nazareth had been demonstrated as God's servant. Then in Acts chapter 2 and verse 43, fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So it was the case that as the infant church took root, God was validating his word by these signs and wonders. First of all, through Jesus Christ, and that's significant as we look at the history of Stephen, and then by the apostles themselves. And again and again, as you work your way through Acts chapter 4 and verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. 
And then Acts chapter 5 and verse 12. Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done. So you've got a man here who manifestly sits in that same trajectory. Jesus Christ is his saviour, his Lord. He is part of the church of Jesus Christ, which is indwelt by the gracious spirit. And like the apostles, and like every other member of that church, he has the Holy Spirit in him. And in his case, as he takes up his particular work, like the apostles and like Jesus Christ, he is acting with demonstrations of the truth that he speaks. Now, there is someone else in the history of Israel, and this is going to be significant as we move on, who also spoke God's truth, and it was attested with signs and wonders. In fact, there are two distinct men, but the one that we should take note of is the man Moses, the prophet of God. So just have in your mind, as we move on, that Stephen is a Christ-like man, Stephen is a man of apostolic spirit, and that Stephen is a Moses-like man. And through Stephen, and without any indications of jealousy on the part of the apostles, you can imagine some people, can't you, saying, signs and wonders, that's our special talent. No, they're pleased to see the gospel going forward. Stephen is speaking. And with that speech come great signs and wonders among the people. Primarily, probably, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, to whom he has been particularly sent to care for the widows. And that powerful testimony of both life and lip from a man who is full of grace and the Holy Spirit, provokes fierce opposition. And that's what you see now in verses 9 and 10. Conflict and triumph. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now remember, as we've just said, Stephen is primarily taking care of Greek-speaking believers, the Hellenist widows in the church. And the point here is that that testimony amongst those people is bringing opposition from Greek-speaking Jews. That's the synagogue of the freedmen. This is a gathering in Jerusalem of people who are Jews living in other parts of the ancient world. Uh, quite possibly the descendants of slaves who were taken from Jerusalem by an earlier Roman conqueror. And they've set up their own synagogue so that when they're in Jerusalem, they've got people like them that they can gather together with. And this is a people who are used to fighting. These are people who are taken away from their ancestral homeland and from the place where in Judaism God preeminently made himself known. These are people who are used to fighting for their identity as true Hebrews, the people of God indeed. They are inclined towards defensiveness with regard to their Jewish identity and activity and it's quite possible then that the kinds of things that Stephen is saying and preaching sound to them like he is a traitor now the synagogue of the freedmen Cyrenians Alexandrians those from Cilicia and Asia Commentators have enormous fun with this verse. Believe it or not, some of them say more about this verse than almost anything else because they're trying to work out how many synagogues we're talking about. Is it one? Is it two? Is it five? Well, it seems most likely that it is one synagogue and it's made up of these freedmen who are gathered from all these various places. Now, boys and girls, can you think of one of the most prominent names in the entire New Testament 
who would be associated with a place called Silesia. I'll give you a clue. There's a city there called Tarsus. Right. It's at least likely that Saul of Tarsus belongs to the synagogue of the freedmen. Now, just for two minutes or so, let your mind run in that direction. This is a man who's been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. This is a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, concerning the law, blameless. A lover of Moses, above all men, as the epitome of what it means to be truly a Hebrew. This, this is a man who boils with rage against Jesus of Nazareth. He's been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. He is a brilliant scholar. And he is a man marked by covetousness. Paul acknowledges that himself. Now we usually think of covetousness as having to do with material goods, wanting what someone else has got. I'm going to suggest to you that in Paul's case, his covetousness was being the best. And Paul was used to being the best. Paul was used to winning every argument. Paul was used to being top dog. Now notice that in the synagogue of the freedmen, some begin to dispute with Stephen. When Stephen is speaking, when Stephen is preaching these arguments begin to arise. Now we've seen this disputatious language before. The Pharisees have disputed with somebody else previously. They have disputed with Jesus Christ himself. And it's quite likely here that Luke is beginning to sow in our minds as we think of a man who does great wonders and signs as we think of a man who is disputed with by the synagogue of the freedmen, that you're beginning to get the message that this man is truly a godly man. He is truly a Christ-like man. He is also a Moses-like man. And when they dispute with Stephen, they are not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now this seems to be a direct fulfilment of the promises of the Lord Jesus toward his disciples. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 12 we were told that the Holy Spirit will teach you in the hour in which you're brought into dispute. In that very hour the Holy Spirit will teach you what you ought to say. And then in Luke chapter 21 and verse 15, this is exciting to see these things fulfilled. I will give you very specifically a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. And that's what's happening here in the synagogue of the freedmen amongst these Greek-speaking Jews. They're taking Stephen to task. They're listening to what this man is saying and it's making their blood boil. And if they're anything like Saul of Tarsus, you begin to understand why, especially as you read on into chapter 7. The point here is not that Stephen is simply an intellectually brilliant person. He's clearly no fool. But it's not just the fact that he's got better mental equipment than anybody else. You can imagine perhaps some of you boys and girls being in a, a classroom at school or at university and you're used to being top marks. You're used to being the kid who gets the A's and the A stars. And somebody else comes into the classroom that no one's ever heard of before and all of a sudden he's getting three, four marks in the grade scheme more than you are and you're no longer top dog. That's not just the problem here. This is not just someone who can outwit someone in argument. This is wisdom from heaven. This is spiritual force. Stephen is handling the Old Testament in a way that these men have never heard it handled before. And he's showing its beauty, how comprehensive, how consistent, how coherent it is. And he's bringing the Lord Jesus Christ to bear. And there's a holy logic here that they can't deny 
Stephen is, is sort of forcing them, as Christ has done in the past. If this is true, and this is true, you can almost imagine him doing this, can't you? And if this is so, if the scriptures say this, if Isaiah says this, if Micah says this, if Jeremiah says this, then who is this Jesus? And they can't argue with him. They hate the answers to which Stephen draws them. They cannot abide the conclusions which Stephen's handling of the scriptures forced them to reach. The Holy Spirit is at work. If I can again reach forward a little bit in the history, we might say he is goading them. He's poking them with a sharp stick to see what the truth really is. What is the response? Lies and hatred. Verse 11, then the synagogue of the freedmen, these men who've been arguing with Stephen, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, this Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now here you've got an example of something that Paul as an apostle will write in 2 Corinthians in chapter 2. That the word of God, when it comes with this kind of spiritual power, is a dividing implement. It's either light and life, or it exposes and condemns. And that's what's taking place here. Stephen's preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit is drawing a dividing line and it's provoking to anger and to rage those who are spiritually blind. And what you're reading then here is the typical response of proud and angry men when they feel like someone else has got the better of them. And you see this in the world at large. People don't come back to you with better arguments. They attack you because you've beaten their arguments. The Latin phrase, ad hominem, to the man. Can't deal with the message? Strike the messenger. Don't like the preaching? Attack the preacher. Deceit and violence. Secret machinations. They secretly induced men to say... We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And then false accusations. This man doesn't speak, cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, this is gross hypocrisy. And we've seen it before. We've seen it in the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember when the Pharisees were so furious with him because of what he was doing on the Lord's Day? And they plotted to kill him. They plotted to kill him on the day that they were so angry that he wasn't keeping holy enough. See the hypocrisy? Now, the law says that you should not speak evil against God and the ruler of the people. It also says you shouldn't bear false witness. So they've now got together some false witnesses to accuse Stephen of blasphemy. You see the tortured way that a sinful mind works? We will break the law in order to accuse someone who isn't breaking the law of breaking the law. And we use the broken law as our excuse to get our own back on him it's a smear campaign can you imagine pharisee facebook at this moment what social media would be saying about stephen in jerusalem under these circumstances being cancelled doesn't begin to describe it this they say is blasphemy against moses and god now they're not saying that moses is divine but that moses 
as the man who spoke from God is now being blasphemed against in his role as the prophet of God, as one who represents God to the people. And this is where you see the blindness. Because our Lord Jesus had himself said, you have Moses and the prophets, but you don't understand him. If you knew Moses, you would know me, because Moses spoke about me. And then they get specific, these false witnesses this man doesn't stop speaking blasphemous words against this holy place. That would be the temple and Jerusalem and the law. Now these are sacrosanct in Jewish thinking. The temple is where God dwells. This is where God is known. The law, this is what God has given. This identifies us as his people. And by keeping this law we prove ourselves true Jews and we obtain salvation from God and Peter sorry Stephen is saying that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses you heard that accusation before that's what they accused the Lord of doing when he said if you tear this down I'll rebuild it in three days and they didn't understand then that he wasn't talking about the temple physically, but about his own body. It's easy to imagine how they reached this flawed conclusion. If you have not much sense of what might have provoked this, then read this afternoon, chapter 7. Because there's a man full of faith and power preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit and rehearsing and reiterating and pressing home all of the things that have already made the freedmen of the synagogue, the synagogue of the freedmen, so angry. What is he doing? He's preaching Jesus as God's saviour. He's preaching the Nazarene as the Messiah of God. If you want another taste of what has provoked them to such anger... Read again the letter to the Hebrews because it's making the same points and it's hitting the same targets. What might Stephen have been saying? The law is fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth and it's passing away. That the sacrifices are ended because the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has come. That there is no longer any need for a priesthood. For we have a great high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he and he only is our abiding representative. And so the Levitical priesthood is now null and void. That the nations are being gathered together. That in Christ Jesus the kingdom of God has been flung wide. So that the promise is not just to you and to your children, but to all who are afar off. That whether it's you or your children or anyone from the nations of the world, if God calls them to himself, they will come, they will be accepted, and they will be part of the new covenant people of God. That salvation is not by the keeping of the law. That salvation is of the Jews only in the sense that it is through that line that Messiah has come. That salvation is by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. That the saviour of sinners, the Messiah of God, is the man who hung and died on a Roman cross at your hands. That the man who died under the curse of God is the only mediator between God and men. That man, Christ Jesus. And that he is the true temple of God. And all who believe in him are now living stones bound together in the temple of which he is the chief cornerstone. And that the law of God is no longer written on tablets of stone. But the commands are written by the Holy Spirit himself on the fleshy tablet of the hearts of all those who are made new in Christ Jesus. We've heard him say 
that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. It's one of those so near and yet so far moments, isn't it? On one level, it's absolutely true. On another, they've missed the point altogether. But these are the secret manoeuvres and these are the false accusations which they bring against Stephen. Again, who does he sound like? What is his experience like? In Mark 14, many bore false witness against Jesus, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. It's there again in Luke 21, Matthew 26. Stephen is like Christ. Like Christ in the truth which he preaches, and like Christ in the assaults which he faces. Brothers and sisters, don't expect the world, secular or religious, to fight fair. The speakers of God's truth will be lied against and plotted against. Even this week, I've had phone calls from a couple of younger pastors who have been subjected to these behind-hand machinations and false accusations. Do you know what one of the things that hurts them most is? Pastor Walker, it's not even true. And I say, brothers, what makes you imagine that those who are lies slaves to the father of lies are going to speak the truth about God's people it's one of the agonies of pastoral ministry it's one of the agonies of Christian testimony in the world that people will twist what you say will accuse you of all kinds of falsehoods it is the way that the enemy works it cuts deep because even with that almost innate sense of truth and justice. But, but it's, it's not fair. What makes any of you think that the devil's going to fight fair? But it's not true. When did you expect truth from the father of lies? Even the world's confused at the moment, isn't it? Fake news. Who knows what to believe? Now, I'm not saying that there aren't things that go wrong and there aren't falsehoods that are sometimes proposed or, or, or men of God, at least on the surface, who don't fall in, never fall into sin. But I am saying this, that you should expect in spiritual warfare battle to be joined at the point of truth and lies. And it will be the part of God's people to be falsely accused. Especially with regard to what they preach and teach. You can take almost any snippet of any preacher and turn him into a half heretic by cutting off the beginning and the end of any particular sentence. You take a paragraph out of context. It always surprises me. I had this conversation recently again. Um, you know, we, we heard that this is what happens at your church or, or that church. Did you know what pastor so-and-so is doing? Now that's fascinating. When did you hear him do that? Oh, well, we've heard it said. Oh, you've heard it said. Who, who told you? Oh, that wouldn't be fair to say. Uh, okay. So when did this person who now we're anonymizing for the sake of you, when were they at the church that they've passed information on to you about? Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure how... The gossips, the rumour mill that goes around? My friends, this is still the way that Satan works. 
we need to be aware that we're dealing with an adversary who is skilled in lying and is not afraid to use secrecy and false accusations to get his own way. Stephen's listening to this. And you can imagine, perhaps, Stephen's blood beginning to boil. Might that not be the case for you if you were being falsely accused by a horde of false witnesses? Especially if they're misrepresenting what you've said about your saviour, Jesus of Nazareth. You could imagine somebody, I think, getting ready to burst out in some kind of holy indignation. But it's not true! And it's not fair. And that's not what I said. But as the false witnesses speak, and as the false accusations roll in, all who sat in the council were gazing at Stephen. And they saw his face as the face of an angel. What a man. Full of faith and power. Full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Now what does it mean to see a man with a face like an angel? You might say, well, nobody's going to accuse too many of us of that. If you assume that this is a reference to physical beauty. Fascinating. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 1. Who is like a wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. That seems to suggest, first of all, that it is not physical beauty, but spiritual loveliness which animates Stephen at this point. But there is something else to remember. Is there anybody else in the Bible whose face ever shone? Moses. There's someone else too. The Lord Jesus himself. Why did Moses' face shine? Because he'd been on the mountain with God. He had had communion with with the Most High. The glory of the Lord had passed before Moses. And when he came down from his dealings with God, the peace and the joy that were in his soul seemed to radiate out of his whole body. The Lord Christ also was transformed on the mountain. It wasn't just his face that shone, was it? His whole being seemed to radiate light. What are these Pharisees accusing Stephen of? You're preaching up this Jesus. And you're bringing down our Moses. My friends, the most Moses-like man they've ever met is standing in front of them. A man full of faith and power, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whose relationship with God is such that the beauty of the Lord is reflected in his face. It's like the face of an angel. Such is his closeness to God that within a few moments he will be looking into heaven as God unveils it. And seeing his saviour standing at the right hand of the power. You know the tragedy? That his enemies can see it but they don't care. They're struck by this glory. But they are not moved by this glory. And that is fearful hardness of heart. And you might say... How fearful to hear a man speak like that about Jesus of Nazareth 
and so to misinterpret everything he says and to miss all the indications of the power and presence of the Holy Ghost in the moment in which he is standing there. And yet many of you have heard that kind of preaching. And you have not been moved. Like John the Baptist. Remember him with Herod? Holiness is compelling. Holiness can be convicting. But holiness is not always convincing. It's one thing to know that a man has come from God. You can even be afraid of that without believing the things that he says. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that my face is shining and you can't see it. And I'm not suggesting that every single time that the preaching of the word from this pulpit goes forth, we enjoy the kind of spiritual influence for which we long. But you have heard men preach in this and other places. And they have been full of grace and power. They have spoken truth to you. And you have felt its force. What have you done with it? How have you responded when Jesus of Nazareth has been proclaimed? Stephen, you see, is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. He's the most Christ-like man that some of these Pharisees have ever met. Perhaps the fiercest irony is he's also the most Moses-like man they've ever met. All through this section, Luke is sowing these seeds. He's making these connections. He's joining up the dots. If you've got eyes to see, Stephen is a man who stands where Moses stood. Gazing in adoration on the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Stephen preaches the Messiah that Moses preached. We might say that Moses longed to see the day of Jesus. He spoke about priests and sacrifices and the temple of God. But Moses, by faith, grasped something of what was being pointed to in all the paraphernalia of the old covenant. Moses knew that one day all of this would pass away and the Christ of God would stand forth as the messenger of the new covenant. And in him the law would be fulfilled. And in him the only and lasting sacrifice would be made. And in him a prophet and a priest and a king would stand before and for the people. And in him the temple made with hands would pass away. And in him, a new and living way would be opened for every person who trusts in Jesus to go personally into the most holy place and to enjoy the presence and the blessing of God. What do you pray for today? What do you think the church of Jesus Christ needs today? Some people think we need better organisation. We need a more prominent voice. We need to sit at the table of culture. We need to reorganise the churches so that their, their weight of numbers can be felt. We need to have an in to government. May I suggest to you that what this church and every church truly needs is men like Stephen. Men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Men full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Men marked by grace and power. I don't mean that everybody will think they're speaking the truth. They will be hated. They will be despised. They will be falsely accused. 
but they will also be God's means of winning many to Jesus Christ. We need Christ-like men. We need Christ-like women. We need preachers who are like Stephen, like the apostles, not necessarily now in doing the external signs and wonders, but whose ministry of truth is attested to by the inward working of the Spirit in the hearts of those who hear. Full of grace, full of faith. My friends, my brothers and sisters, do you want to live well? Do you want to serve well? Do you want to die well? Do you want to suffer well? Do you want to honour Christ? Then you need to trust in Stephen's Saviour. And you need to walk in Stephen's steps because Stephen is following Jesus. Yes, you can see the echoes of Moses here. And I think that Luke is deliberately weaving that into the narrative to show the, the blindness and the irony of the Jewish accusation that this man is against Moses. But a greater than Moses is here. Stephen is like Jesus Christ. Stephen is speaking his truth, walking in his ways, suffering for him and suffering like him. It is of people like Stephen that before long the risen Jesus will ask the question, why are you persecuting me? He is one of Christ's men. He is one of Christ's followers. Are you willing to walk the same path as Stephen? A lot of people would probably quite like to be at the front end of this passage. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the... Ah, yes, that's what we want today. What comes with the powerful preaching of the pure truth? Behind the scenes assaults, false witnesses, untrue accusations, beatings and even death. It's not just are you willing, my friends, are we eager? Are we eager to honour Christ as Stephen honoured Christ? Have we done what Jesus of Nazareth called his disciples to do? To count the cost and to take up our cross and to follow him. My friends, for this we need the Holy Spirit. He is given to the people of God, is he not? He's been poured out on the church of Jesus Christ. Do you long to see more of his presence and to know more of his power? Do you pray that God would give us more of his Holy Spirit? Do you pray that you individually might not be one who is grieving the Holy Spirit so that in your life and in this church you are undermining the very things that congregationally we say we long for and love and live for? It's a rare thing, but there are stories still of men who've looked like angels, of preachers who could be heard walking back and forth in a room before preaching. And when some servant was sent to find them, back in the days when in this society we still had those kinds of servants, they went back to the people who'd sent them and said, there's somebody in there with him and he says he won't come until that friend is coming too. I listened at the door and I could hear the preacher speaking. Don't let me go alone. I cannot go 
unless you come with me. And I'm not talking just about men in the 16th or 17th or 18th century. There are men who have preached. Some of you have heard some of them at least sometimes. With a manifest sense of the spirit of God at work in them and through them. And that is what we desire. And what will happen? We will suffer with Jesus Christ. And what will happen? We shall reign with the King of Kings. Are you praying and pleading and labouring and preserving those kinds of blessings? Amen. Amen.